Welcome back, Swag Team. It's your boy, the Swagologist, back with another Swag You Review. And today we're talking about The Last Dance, episodes 7 and 8. And the, the, the story keeps on chugging, man. It's the journey to the last game of the 98 season, the last dance of the Bulls, 97 to 98 season, where they run up in the sunset with the six championship rings. But they're trying to show you how they got there, and they're going over Jordan's career. And I'm loving every second and moment of this docuseries. That is on ESPN currently. You can watch it right now, so make sure you get to it. Also, check out my other reviews for this for this series. You know what I'm saying? Here's one right here. Make sure you go check it out so you can get caught up and enjoy all this stuff about Jordan. But anyways, episode 7 and 8 were both great. They have some of my favorite moments so far through the docu-series. I really like how the vibe started off with the beginning scene of Jerry Krause and Craig having a conversation. Well, not a, really a conversation. It's more like a press conference media session. And Craig asked him, how surprised are you that the team is still winning and the camaraderie is still there and the team is still there with all the backstabbing between the front office and the head coach? And then he was like, Craig was, I mean, uh, Jerry Cross was like, I can't believe you would say something so unprofessional. And first of all, it's because they're a team and they're professional, unlike the comment you just made. Well, we're done, gentlemen, and leaves. And it just set off the whole vibe of the whole episode. Plus, I love the reporters talking about, thanks, Craig. <laughs> so that was good. The episode goes along and it centers around how Gordon kind of was tired. He was kind of fed up. He was done. You know what I'm saying? Kind of done with the NBA. And stuff like that. Then they started segueing how his dad was a big influence on his life in general and helped him through tough decisions, making tough decisions. And then they actually went into how his father ended up passing away, which was enlightening to me because I knew that his dad died. I wasn't sure how. I know his body was found somewhere in a river, but I didn't know how he like I didn't know he got shot or whatever I didn't know exactly the details you know and for some reason it didn't I know he didn't die of natural causes of course but I also didn't think it was like a shooting for some reason I don't know but it was it was it was it was interesting to find out and enlightening really they showed how close that Jordan and his dad was and if you think about it the first three championships everywhere or any time big moment that Jordan has had in his life, his father was always right there, right over his shoulder. These episodes, well, the seventh episode, at least mostly, talks focuses more on Jordan's retirement and the, and why he retired. And his dad, his dad dying, first of all, was a, definitely a major key in this. But also, the media is just beating him down about gambling and all this dumb stuff then he wins it despite all the odds but then he's like in and he's talking to his dad about possibly going to baseball he's been wanting to go to baseball he's done everything he needed to do for the bulls he's won three championships for him he made the nba global by winning in yeah. usa basketball so he's done that he's did more than magic and larry's done with three a three p he's done everything he felt like he wanted to accomplish in the nba so now he's thinking about going to baseball and his father who put him on baseball as a young child has is agreeing with him and telling him he should do it and then he always makes a big decision with his father but then when his father dies it just kicked it all in the high gear to give it up and move on to baseball now people look at it now as a dumb decision to go to baseball because they felt like that he was trash but when you watch the documentary you actually find out that he was actually pretty decent and he could have the ability to went to the major leagues but he had a stretch where he was playing very bad baseball but I mean he's also new to baseball he played when he was like 14 13 or whatever it was and then he ain't play until he was 33 years old it's so, a different feel, you know what I mean? Like, you can't just jump from one to jump to the other and think you're just going to be great. But that's the thing. That's the thing about Mike. How how great Mike was in the NBA, people put the pressure on him to be that great in baseball, and you shouldn't have done that. Now, like I said, the documentary proves that he could have actually made it to Major League because many different people that worked with him in the baseball said he could have made it. Now, I'm not saying he could have been the greatest of all time, but he would have been good for sure. 
and he and with his competitive nature he would have gotten better which he did even after that bad stretch he had where the media was just trashing him the media trashed him so bad that sports center put him on a cover you know what i'm saying it was like bagging mike uh, michael jordan and embarrasses the league or whatever embarrasses baseball so after that he was done with sports illustrated and never graced their cover again and they missed out on a you know some great stuff because of that I'm sure because I mean after that the three peat again six championships that's why we're having the documentary and sports illustrated f that up by doing that to Michael we move on to finding out that he was really tough on his players like his teammates all the time he was like really in their shit like on them going in on them bullying them, like toughing them up and like for me, I didn't necessarily see it as bullying because me and my homeboys, we talk to each other like that sometimes. And depending on who you're talking to, you know who to talk to like that and who you can't talk to like that. You know, it, it, it's a little different just because Mike sometimes did it to people that just got onto the team. So, you know, you do that to them. They don't know you. You know, they might not be from where you're from and not feel that. But like I said, in my inner circles, sometimes we talk to each other like that. If you there, you know, uh, if you inward here, you know, stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Whereas in some circles, that's not cool. In some circles, it's fine, you know. So I didn't really look at it as bullying per se, but I could see where people can get that. This is what set off episode seven for me anyway, is because... When he started, when Michael Jordan started reflecting on that, and he was talking about his competitiveness and how, how he wanted to win at all costs, and if that meant getting in your ass when you wasn't acting right, that means he's gonna get in your ass. And if you know, this is just who he is. He plays to win, and he wanted you to win too. And the only way he felt like he could make you win is maybe getting in your ass and give you some tough love here and there. You know what I mean? And like he said, like he said, he that's just who he is and if you don't um th th that's how he played the game you know what i'm saying and if you don't want to play that way then don't play that way you know but he's not going he's not going to let you pussyfoot around and come in there all soft and stuff he's going to try and build you up and if you can't take it then you just you're not the right teammate for michael jordan you know what i'm saying and he ain't going to bat an eye on that he's just going to find someone that can handle it you know what i mean so that was very interesting, and I love the way that ended because it ended with Michael Jordan giving that speech. I paraphrased it a lot just now, and got emotional to the point where he had to take a break, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying from the interview. And I was like, man, that was that was something. That that was just that was beautiful TV. I don't know why it was so engaging and so incredible, but it was it was something serious. So then Major League Baseball had a a, a, a buyout or a. a, a a buyout, a boycott, or whatever the hell it was, you know what I'm saying, where they wasn't paying, um, the players wasn't playing that year, and baseball decided that they was going to go, or Major League was decided in 1995 that they was going to go and make players play with replacement players instead of the actual players, and Jordan was like, I'm not doing that. And I think that helped start off him wanting to come back. But they also, before that, they talked about Scotty, and the rest of the team without Jordan since Jordan retired and what they did to try and win a championship without Jordan. And they played very well together. This actually showed how great Phil Jackson is as a coach. And it showed his ability to handle these many personalities, take take care of the offense, and use the triangle to its fruition without Jordan. And some people would believe that he couldn't even do it. But even the great Chuck Daly, coach of the Pistons, said, um, let's see you run the triangle without Jordan. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Try to play him or whatever like that. So, But he, he played some of his best coaching that season because all he had was Scotty, and Scotty's not even a scorer. He's more of a facilitator, and they played by committee, as Scotty said, and they actually did some great things. But then there was like this part was like the final shot to win the game, but Phil decided that he was going to go with Kukoc. Now, Kukoc, has been hitting, out, knocking down, game-winning shots all season long. All season long. At this point, Phil Jackson knew he could hit it. So he designed a play for Phil Jackson, I meant for Kukoc, Tony Kukoc, to hit the game-winning shot. 
but my man Scotty had a big problem with this. He wasn't feeling this because Scotty felt like I'm the new, you know, I'm, I had an MVP caliber season, I had an all star season for sure, and I'm the leader of the team. I'm the baddest man on the team. Why are you setting this up for Tony when it should be me to take the shot to win the game? But Phil didn't change his mind, so he asked Scotty because Scotty said he's not going in now. Like, Scotty decided, I'm not playing because y'all on this BS. Y'all want to give me the ball. I ain't doing it. Bump it. So he sat down. He's like, I'm not playing. Well, um, you know, even though Bill Cartwright's right there trying to talk to him and tell him why he shouldn't just be sitting there not playing, he's like, screw that. I'm not playing. So Phil goes up there and he's like, so you in or out? He says he's out. Steve Kerr was like, I remember Phil Jackson was like, fuck him. <laughs> bring in old boy. Uh, bring old boy in. So then next man up. They run the play. Tony hits the shot. Bang! Hits it. They win the game. They, they're happy at the moment, but then when they go in the locker room, it's all it's kind of sadness because Bill Cartwright was hurt, you know, that Scotty Pippen would give up on him like that. Like, why would you do that to us? You know what I mean? He asked them why he did that, and Scotty realized that he was wrong in that situation to handle it like that, and he wished it wouldn't have happened um, in the first place, and he apologized to the team. But he also said if it was to happen again, he'd probably do the same thing <laughs> because – he just felt like it was a slight. It was, you know, you know, kind of a backstab by Phil to not give it to him when he knows, like, if it was Jordan, he would definitely give it to Jordan. You know what I'm saying? Stuff like that. But it's just sometimes you got to trust in your coach, but I understand where Scotty was coming from. So then we move on, like I said, to the fact that the baseball wanted to do replay, replacement players and Jordan didn't want, wasn't feeling that. So then Jordan starts talking to B.J. Armstrong, and B.J. Armstrong's about to go to practice. So Jordan's like, Hey, why don't we, um, you know, let me come with you to practice and play a little bit. So now he's kind of getting that itch, you know what I'm saying? He's starting start to, start to scratch his back a little bit about his basketball. And then B.J. Armstrong decides to talk some shit. And you know, from watching this so far, you should know. And if you don't know, you definitely going to know between 7 and 8 that if you talk shit to Jordan, that's your ass. So then B.J. Armstrong decided to talk Jordan. Talk shit, talk about you too old now. You've been out of basketball. I'll whoop your ass right now. And at first it was a joke, but then all of a sudden they're playing one on a full one on one at the practice. And then all the other team members are like, "Yo, the man is here!" And they're going crazy. Everything feels different. And they're like practicing and stuff. And week by week they keep practicing and practicing. And all of a sudden he's coming back. So then they're trying to figure out they they're trying to figure out how to tell the tabloids and everything that he's coming back and all that stuff and then um his dude Falk that got him the shoe deals trying to write him up something and he, and Jordan was like not even feeling it so he's like let, let me get the like he was like you write one so Mike was like all right and all he did was write I'm back <laughs> you know what I'm saying and the world went nuts you know what I'm saying my man's back so everybody's trying to see him everybody's trying to get tickets to see him and he comes back and this is where he gets that famous 45 because some people don't know but Jordan did come back to the Bulls wearing number 45 and the reason he was wearing 45 now this is what I wasn't sure of I was trying to figure out why the reason he was wearing 45 was because his father wasn't going to see him play anymore and he didn't feel right wearing 23 23 is where he wore when his dad was there so then he went back to 45 the first number he played with in high school. He just felt more comfortable. It's a new, it's a starting of a new era without his father back with the team. So he wanted to start fresh. So he played in 45. He didn't play quite well. He, wa he wasn't quite ready. Um, you know, he still had that baseball body, so he really wasn't himself. Six games later, six games later, 95 to 96 to the, um, against the Hawks, he comes down crossover and and, and 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 his money shot is the free throw line two point shot jumper you know saying fade away he he hits the sideline hits the fade bang and wins the game jordan is back then he goes the next game on the schedule is the knicks right in madison square garden and this is where the double nickel game comes up the 55 he started balling and then they really knew jordan was back and it was about to be trouble he was so good in that game that Patrick Ewan had a good game and no and no one even talks about that why because my man Jordan dropped 55 coming back to the NBA rocking 45 you know what I'm saying so it was crazy then he ends up going against the Magic and what's bittersweet about this Magic matchup is that Horace Grant had just got had got traded while 
Jordan was gone. Now, when Jordan comes back, they got Luke Longley, they got some other folks, and Jordan, I mean, and uh, Horace Grant has moved on to the uh, Magic, and he's with Shaq and Penny. Now, I didn't even know this. I didn't know that this took place. I didn't know that they lost to these boys or whatever. But what ended up happening, like I said, they ended up losing. But there was, uh, at first, they, was, they lost the um, first game. And Jordan didn't have a really good game. And on top of that, Nick Anderson. And here we go. Nick Anderson decided to talk some shit. And when you talk some shit to Jordan, that's your ass. So he talked to him. He had, he had said that he didn't say it to Jordan, but he said it to the world. He was like, 45 ain't 23. Why would you go and say that? Because <laughs> once you said that, this is what's going to happen. Matter of fact, let me give you a little story that happened in the documentary in The Last Dance in 7 and 8. So there was this dude that played for the Bullets, right? And he played his heart out. He played really good against Jordan. Jordan was missing a lot of shots. Now, mind you, Jordan, like I said, if you talk shit to Jordan, dash your ass. Well, apparently, after the game, dude dropped 37 on Jordan, right? Jordan wasn't making many shots. So he goes to Jordan. And he puts his arm around him after the game. They're leaving out, out of the gym. Before he leaves out of the gym, he's like, good game, Mike, and walks out. Good game, Mike. Mike said, all right, <laughs> all right. So then the next game, because they playing him on back-to-back, that's where he did, this dude made his mistake. You don't say, good game, Mike, when y'all got a back-to-back. So they playing, they, they, like I said, dude did well, dropped 37 on Mike in Chicago. They go to Washington. Jordan says before they get off the plane to B.J. Armstrong, he's like, bro, I'm going to have what this kid had in the first half. <laughs> Jordan goes in there going at my man. Going at him, killing him, killing him. Dropped 36 in the first half. Second half, just straight killed him. Got 10 more points on the board. Dropped 47 on him. You know what I'm saying? All because dude said, good game, Mike, before they left in the gym. But you know what's crazy? The top row on this, when they go years later to talk to Mike about that alleged thing, because apparently there's rumors that this didn't even take place. They asked the Jordan... It, did it happen? He's like, no. <laughs> I made it up with a big smile on his face. Because Jordan will go at any length to get your heart and snatch it out. You know what I'm saying? He will go at any length to win. And sometimes he'll make up stories just to get him motivated to beat you. So when Nick Anderson decided to say 45 ain't 23, next game. I'm talking about next game. Jordan's right at 23 all of a sudden. <laughs> And on top of that, he went to their ass. <laughs> he dropped, I forgot that you dropped in the game, but they ended up winning, and Jordan had a hell of a game once again. He just went off from the opening tip to the end of the tip, and then it was like 23 is back. And he was like, now in the interview, he was like, I just wanted to uh, go back to what I felt more comfortable, more natural. But all of us know the reason he dropped that 23 back on is because my man said Jordan 845. I meant 23 8. Um, 45. Yeah, all right. Okay. I'll show you what 23 is there. Let's get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the crazy thing was, the, Bull, uh, the Bulls ended up losing that series to the Magic. You know what I'm saying? They ended up losing to Patrick. I mean, not to Patrick. Torres Grant, first of all. That was the number one crook in his car, but they lost to Penny and Shaq, young Penny and Shaq. And they was carrying Horace Grant on their shoulders like, woo, 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 woo which really probably set in Jordan's craw. It set in his craw so much that he went to his personal trainer and was like, the personal trainer was like, so when when should I expect to see you? He's like, tomorrow. Now, normally, they take a little time off, but Jordan wasn't playing no games because and his, 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 his personal trainer got a little emotional during the interview about this. This is how I found out this information from him. And he was like, because Jordan knows that if you pay your good hard cash, you know, your hard earned cash to come see him play on TV or, or, you know, in the, in the stands, doesn't matter. If you came to see him play is his obligation, his job to give you his best. And he didn't feel like he gave you his best. So he going to see you, his personal trainer tomorrow to make sure 
after the summer. Like, he ain't having a summer break. Tomorrow, he going to be in there playing with him. You know what I'm saying? But the crazy part is, he had to get ready. And also, he was shooting Space Jam at this time. I'm like, bro, how are you going to play Space Jam? You know what I'm saying? Dupe Space Jam and get ready for the season after not playing for 21 months or however long it was. You know what I'm saying? I think it was 21 months, something like that. Two, a year and a half anyway. And be ready to get back into perfect shape. Now, he played well, but he didn't play up to par because in that last series, the reason they lost is because Jordan couldn't get his legs by under him. He wasn't ready. And they wasn't ready as a team anymore. You know what I'm saying? Because they already lost the clout of the championship the year prior. So they wasn't ready as a team. So he ends up shooting Space Jam, but the the way he got back into basketball shape was when he bring all the different great players to come over there to the Jordan Dome because they made him a whole gym for him to shoot because he's like, the only way I'm doing this movie is if I can practice because that was more important than Space Jam was, even though I love Space Jam. It's one of my favorite movies all the time. As a kid, I watched it a hundred times and I can't wait for Space Jam 2. Just wanted to throw that out there. But anyways, they brought them in and it was smart on Jordan's part because he would do that to scout the other players, learn their moves, learn their tricks, learn the younger players, learn their styles, get more agility and more amp, more um, you know energy to play them. And I don't know how he was doing it because he would shoot like, you know, hour long, like a bunch of hours, not just an hour, but, you know, hours long shifts of movie you know what i'm saying then play basketball right after that and then have to go right back to shooting movies you know what i'm saying afterwards so i don't know how he did it but he did it you know what i mean so then we move on to this game where bj armstrong is now with in 1998 he's now with the charlotte hornets and he has to face his old teammates to keep them from winning a championship and it's funny because everybody's got them as sweeping the bull. I mean, sweeping the Hornets. Got them sweeping them. They beat them the first game, tore them up. But now, B.J. Armstrong, knowing the Bulls, knowing their playbook, knowing how they play, knowing Michael Jordan, he had a game. You know what I'm saying? That's all he could say. He's like, I had a game, I had a moment, and I took it. You know what I'm saying? I knew about the Bulls, so I wanted to see if it would work, and it worked. And B.J. Armstrong did definitely put in work and he hit the game like the game put away the dagger in the Bulls heart in that um, game two knocks it down but then guess what he decided to talk some shit and when you talk some shit to Michael Jordan that's your ass because he decided to go woo at the bench and woo at Jordan after scoring that last the last shot well Next game, Jordan went straight at my man B.J. Armstrong, kept him to only four points, and he ended up being on the bench midway before the end of the fourth quarter. And it was most definitely wraps ever since then. The game was over. There was no coming back. They had destroyed him by that point. Every time, I don't know why these people keep doing this. I mean, Jordan doesn't need anything else to get him going, to get him on point, to start balling. But when you talk some shit, that's your ass, man. You just you just can't do it. So I don't know why they do it, but they do it every time. And then Jordan got to go to that ass. You know what I mean? You know? So that that was crazy, but this was even more crazy. And this is my other, this is one of my favorite moments. Like, my first favorite moment was Jerry Krause in the very beginning having that conversation with Craig Sager and, or Jaeger. And, and it didn't come off that nice to Craig and it was funny but my favorite moment in this whole episode my favorite moment of of the series where Gary Payton because the Supersonics and the Bulls were going up against each other you know for the fifth championship now this is the fifth championship for the Bulls and they gotta go against Gary Payton the glove and Sean Kemp now this is a great team and everything but The problem is Jordan and Amar Rashad was having dinner at this restaurant and George Carl, the current coach of that uh, Sonics team, was in the building eating as well. His mistake was, though, he got up and decided to pass Jordan and not speak to him at all. 
So, as you may all know, if you slight Jordan or you talk some shit, that's your ass. So he ended up talking. He didn't end up talking shit, but he ended up he he slighted him because he didn't talk to him. And all Jordan needs is something like that, and that'll set it off. So they so because of that, Jordan torched him for the first three games, destroyed him for the first three games of the series. Just it was bad. It was bad. So it was three zero. You know what I'm saying? The Sonics and Gary don't look good right now. The glove is not looking good. It looks off. You know what I'm saying? It looks like the glove is off. It ain't on right now. You know what I mean? But the reason being is because George Carl did not want to use Gary Payton's defense during this series. He wanted it for him for scoring. He's like, I know you can do defense. I want you to score. I don't need you holding Mike or whatever like that. But Gary was like, bump all that. I'm holding Mike because you you don't understand. We're getting killed, and I need to stop this man. So let me let me get on. Let me tire him out. That that's his old mindset. Let me tire him out. If I tire him out, we are gonna win this game. So game four comes around, and Gary's on Mike, and Gary is aggravating Mike, making it tough to score. Jordan is not playing well, and it looks to me that Gary is you know doing his job. He's tiring him out, and he even talks about it. He's like, you just gotta tire him out. You know what I'm saying? You got to, you know, you know, yeah, tire him out, tire the fuck out of him. And I was tiring him out and, uh, you know, it took a toll on Mike. It took a toll on him. You know what I mean? And when he's saying this, you all of a sudden see Mike with the tablet because the director would give him a tablet and let him see somebody else speaking or, or another interviewee. But sometimes he'll give him a tablet or a phone to look at who was talking and when they were talking and see how they felt about that. So they, he gave, he gives Jordan a tablet Jordan gets the tablet and he's looking at it and listening to um, my man talk about the game and how he tired him out, tired him the fuck out. And like, it took a toll on Mike. It took a toll on him. You know, I don't know if it would have changed this. Um, the outcome, and when he said that, Jordan was like, <laughs> but I know it took a toll on him. And Jordan was like, hysterically laughing. I'm talking about belly out. He's like, <laughs> killing the laugh and that joke was so funny to me i'm like this dude <laughs> it's just that he ain't right he just hysterically laughing and the reason he was laughing is because he was like the glove i had no problem with the glove none gary payton i had no problem with gary payton i had a lot more other things on my mind and then you come to realize this is the first finals the first championship one of the one of the biggest moments in his life that his dad's not going to be around to see it with him. And you realize that, that that would take a toll on him. And on top of that, game six, because in game five, he ended up, they ended up losing game four and five because my man Gary Payton was on him, but also Jordan wasn't focused anymore. He wasn't focused. So game six is on June 16th, and that so happens to be Father's Day that year. And I know this is probably the one of the toughest feats that Jordan has ever had to make because his father wasn't going to be there with him. And, I, and I, you can see it through the beginnings of the game that is like taking a toll on Mike. And but he played his heart out and he played he played for his father. You know what I mean? He played for his dad and he played for his family and played strong and kept strong. You could you could tell something was on his mind, but you couldn't tell that it was bothering him to the level of where he couldn't play or he was crying or sobbing during the game. But they have that famous image of him laying on the ground with the basketball and sobbing, but you could actually hear it. And when you hear it, it like it hits you. It may not make you cry because I didn't cry or anything, but it does hit you. You feel that. It's a it's a moment that you'll never forget. You know what I mean? So when you see that, you'll understand what I'm talking about. It's crazy, but for them to win that fifth championship, because in that game, he played amazing, and they shut him down, and you know, anytime Jordan gets in a sixth game with the finals to win it, he gonna win it, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So they ended up winning, and you see him on the ground crying, and it just like makes you realize how powerful that moment was, and how big time that fifth championship was, and how how tough Jordan can be. But I love this series. I love episodes seven and eight. I can't wait to see what happens in nine and 10. They also 
went over the myth that I always I always find these little cool nuggets that I always like I think are myths but they really happen because I found out that Jordan, you know, like I was talking about how he may come off as bullying his teammates. Well, at this point, this is one of the times when he first came back to the team, he wasn't feeling like the new guys trusted him yet because he felt like they were pussyfooting around joking because they got the prestige now they're on the bulls or whatever. But dude, we used to be ass. And now that I got here and got us to this level, you are not, you didn't do nothing to get here. So you got to earn your strikes with me. You know what I'm saying? And the way Steve Kerr earned his stripes is he was playing, they was playing one-on-one and, and Phil Jackson was calling these tiki tech fouls because Jordan was being the leader that he is talking junk and, you know, getting under people's ass and stuff like that. So then he was calling these tiki tacky fouls because he felt like Jordan was just being an asshole. So, but then Jordan decided, all right. So he fouled him hard. and was like, now that's a fucking foul. So that when he does that, Phil Jackson is like, Really? And then when he also, in the simultaneously, though, Steve Kerr decided, I'm going to take up for myself and hits Jordan straight in the chest. Or when he hits Jordan straight in the chest, Jordan hits that right in the eye. <laughs> hits a right back in the eye. So I'm like, oh, man. So I wish we could have seen that, sort of, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I know we were going to see it, but they talked about it. So, you know, they told us, we got a visual of what happened. So then Jackson sends him out and... This is the first time you could tell that this obviously this was him bullying someone for once. This is the only time I felt like he bullied someone that at least that we know of. You know, there might be some under the rug that we don't know about, but this is something that's openly now. That's as I consider. But he, but he knew he was wrong because soon as Phil Jackson came down there, he was like, "I know, man, I know." And he wanted to call Steve, and he called Steve, and they made made up. And then ever since then, that's how Steve Kerr earned his stripes with him. And I think other players earned their stripes in different ways as well like that. But that's how they earned their stripes. But I love this series. Favorite moments was the Craig and Jerry Cross at the very beginning. Also, the Steve Kerr and Michael Jordan fight situation. I thought that was crazy. And Jordan belly laughing at Gary Payton was hilarious. But let me know how you feel about episodes seven and eight in the comment section below. Also, if you're new here and you're trying to join the swag team, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. Hit it right here when it pops up on the side. Also, if you want to be the first swag team to see a video when it pops up on YouTube, make sure you hit that notification bell. It'll pop up right when you join the swag team by hitting that subscribe button. You hit that boom, you hit that bell will pop up. You click that ding, then you never miss a video that pops up on the channel, whether it's on your cell phone, computer, tablet, whatever. So make sure you do that so you don't miss out on any of the swag when it drops. But yeah, let me know how you feel about episodes seven and eight in the comment section below and on the social media sites at the bottom let me know your favorite parts as you, as i said my favorites was the craig and jerry Krause, steve kerr and jordan fight and steve i mean and, and michael jordan belly laughing at gary payton's explanation on how he's eating them up when jordan felt like he had no competition at all but let me know in the comment section below on the social media sites and until the next video i love y'all 3000 i'll holla peace